there's always two ways to make a movie. The easy way and the hard way. We choose the hard way every single time. <laughs> and we've had to deal with the MTA, who have been pretty great. We've had to deal with the city of New York. We've had to deal with the people of New York and upsetting the streets. It's been a massive challenge. My first reaction reading the script, which is often the reaction I have with all of Tony's movies, was how are we going to do that? You want to do what? When? Working around with Tony, that's his old hat. You know, he's, you're always pushing the envelope, always going to the edge. And we get there. Somehow we get there. The MTA were fantastic. They gave me real trains and real speed, and, and there's nothing to beat that reality. It's much more dangerous, you know, than when you do it on stage. Brian Helglin, who's a very good friend of mine, we did a Knight's Tale together. And he had come to me and said, did you ever see the 70s movie, Taking a Pelham 123? And I said, I did, and I liked it quite a lot. And we watched it again, and we realized for what it was at that time, it was good, but it didn't take full advantage of, of what the kind of fun story was. And it, it, was, it kind of felt ripe for a, a retelling, not really a remaking, but a retelling. We went to Sony with it and tried to get it going and couldn't really interest them. So I pitched it to Denzel, Todd and I, when he was doing his play in New York. Three years ago, we sat down and they talked about it, and, uh, uh, and I don't know what happened. It went away. And uh, I think, quite frankly, they were looking at other actors at one point, and, uh, you know, whatever the process was with the studios or whatever. And uh, they came back to me a year or so ago. One of the things that attracted me to me was the challenge of making it work. So I'm always looking for a challenge. And, and when Brian and Todd came to me and said, you know, Pelham 123, remember? I said, yeah, I remember it. And I thought, wow, it's a tough movie to pull off because it's really half the movie or more is two guys sitting on the end of the phone talking to each other, you know? I liked Pelham a lot because Pelham, you meet everybody on the fly. They're all at work, whether they're train traffic controllers or police or the mayor or the hijackers, you meet them all right in the middle of doing what they're doing at the opening of the film. What appealed to me was to tell a story that happened in real time and everything we learn about the characters we learn as we see it unfold within that time. I came to the project because of Brian and I came because he had a vision and I could see the combination of his vision and what I would do with that vision, you know, the two of us together. And it's, with us, it's, a, it's an organic process. And I knew he was, in a, he was starting in a great place with the script. And I knew with our research, which I always do, we would take it to this, to this other place, to this next level. In the original novel and in the original film, the, first of all, the, the Garber character, the, the hero in the story is a policeman. He's a transit cop. So what I thought would be more fun to see is to see someone that has no fallback position or no experience to call on when that call came in. We're really making a, a movie about the relationship of these two men and the idea that they're completely separated and that progressively as the movie goes on, it comes closer and closer together. And that's kind of how it's a little different from the original one also. In the original one, they're really apart pretty much for the whole movie. Our third act, we bring them together because hopefully if we've done our jobs right, you want to see these two guys ultimately land in the same room together. So that's kind of where we went with the idea of bringing it into the year 2000, so to speak. A different kind of audience today. I think audiences have a different expectation. They always want to be entertained like they did in the 70s, but they also, I think, like the bad guy and the good guy to be together on screen a little bit longer. I don't think that that movie would have worked exactly today as it did then. I said, okay, well, what are you gonna do to improve that? I mean, you know, that's still a good movie. And it was a very unlikely cast, because Walter Matthau as the part that Denzel was gonna play, and then it had uh, Robert Shaw as the part I would play. And I thought, well, Tony should have a vision. So I met with Tony, and he told me he had a very specific image and uh, design for the movie. In short, it was kind of like the same taking a pill in one, two, three, but on steroids, meaning very intense and very hyped up and very contemporary. What I loved about it, it's two different worlds. There's this dark subterranean world in the bowels of New York, and then you've got this, this cleanliness. And when we, re we researched it, the MTA now looks like NASA. It's huge, it's like a, a, one and a half times the size of a football field. 
There are 100 employees sitting there. They've all got headsets on. You can hear a pin drop. Very different from the original. So I took that world, the quietness, the cleanliness, and the high-tech quality of the MTA, and bounced that with the darkness and the grittiness of the, of the valves in New York in the subways. Every stage of my filmmaking and development is to do with research, you know. So when I'm actually, I get a script, I will always, I'll go out and research the world. And I work with Don Ferrone, who's been with me now, God, 15 years. So Don goes out, he goes to the MTA, for instance, on this movie. Tony and I use the, the term reverse engineering. So we might start from the back of the script and work, work forward, which is really a difficult process to do. But, but in this particular movie, every character that was found in the screenplay, we found a real person. Off that research, we get to tweak and tune the characters, and, you know, and then Brian takes it and he gets these ideas from the real people. The great thing about Tony is he understands an important thing, which is that truth is stranger than fiction, and that you can never really invent something, really, that's better than what you could find that actually happened. So he's a He's a relentless researcher. We give the writers a, a menu, and the menu is all tabbed to different parts of their script, and then to different, and then, then the, that will lead them to a person and a transcript that again is all distilled down. So there's a gigantic process that gets down to a very concentrated product. Through my research, um, we managed to you know, embellish the characters and get a better sense of who they were. And those characters we gave to John and to Denzel. I think Denzel brings to every role he does such realism. Tony and Denzel and I went to the MTA before we started shooting the real MTA, right, Manhattan. And I watched him for about two hours just watching different people. He didn't say anything. He would just stand in the background and he would watch and he would sit at their desk and he would observe. He would ask certain key questions and you could tell he was just a computer taking in all the information of real people. And he knows how to embody real people. So, but that's a good look back though. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. I'm like, because I don't know what he's doing. He might be getting ready to kill me. I don't know what's going on. It was originally written as a cop. You know, then Brian and I sat, sat with Denzel and Brian told the story about his brother-in-law, actually. <laughs> and this story epitomized Denzel's character. And he said, I've played cops. I've played FBI. I've played CIA. I didn't want him to be you know, a cop who's this and he's good with guns. And I just said, he's just a guy. You know, a guy, an ordinary guy in, in, in extraordinary circumstances. But you got to believe that those cops are going to be down there Bring any second. Bring them, motherfucker. Bring them. Unload them. I don't give a shit. The Travolta character is a kind of a composite, but we found several different people who had worked for the city, who had um, embezzled money or, or done different things and gone to prison for it. We interviewed prisoners who had gone in kind of white collar and come out sort of changed by their prison experience and tried to incorporate those things. Tony Scott and I looked at photographs of ex-prisoners and criminals that or gangs and things that were uh, of the moment. Like, what's the latest look for those guys and a lot of them have this kind of teddy boy you know you know long sirens different kinds of face no. hair and uh, you know I was all for the tattoo stuff because I knew that that was part of it so we chose this tattoo here which is a, a, a hand with a gun in it saying my cold dead hands that's ten million dollars plus one cent that is a deal now you call the mayor and you tell him that price John Travolta's character is based on a guy I won't tell you his name but he was caught in the parking violation scandal of 93, I think, yeah. Um, and he and two other guys, uh, the, uh, everybody was caught with a hand in the till. There was a lot of money taken. And so in that time he's in jail, his whole obsession was taking revenge on the city that had taken him down and humiliating the city like he'd been humiliated and getting back the money he felt that he'd lost over those 12 years of loss of life. It's a little bit of the Mark Rich character. He does a money shift, invests in gold, that, dollar drops when they hear the hostage situation in the subway, um, gold rises, and you do a money shift when it's coming back up, and you can make a huge amount of money. Caminetti was based on the real hostage negotiator, a guy called Jack Cambria, and Jack has done more hostage negotiation in the history of America than any other human being. Lieutenant Jack Cambria 
it was the head of the hostage negotiation squad. He was also the guy who, who ran their special services, which is SWAT teams. Knowing what I know about Tony Scott, he likes to keep his productions as realistic as possible. So he wanted uh, you know, to get uh, some concepts of, of what negotiations are all about from an actual NYPD hostage negotiator. So he doesn't really kind of go you know, off the chart with the script. So I, I worked with some of the writers in telling them about what I do, some of the basics of hostage negotiations, what we try to accomplish, and ultimately this is how the script was, although the stuff I gave them at least was written into the script. In the original movie of this, there is no negotiator. That, that, that was invented afterwards. So, uh, uh, but Jack Cambria is the, the, our advisor. So I thought, well, he's an interesting guy. Mr. Garber is the train dispatcher. This is now a police matter. This guy is very calm in the, in the most tense situations. He is at his calmest, and, the, and they know exactly what they're going to do. They're a very, very uh, legendary group, the NYPD hostage negotiators. She says no tactical options at this point. We can't get into that train. And so really the only option is to try to talk to them, negotiate. You can either talk to me, but if you don't want to talk to me, then you have to talk to them. Yeah, yeah. Emergency service, you know, the machine guns and the vests and helmets. Yeah. When you look at John Dutour, John became Jack from his suit to his yellow tie to his blue shirt to his mannerisms. And Jack was on the set. And you know, it's good for actors if whether they want to steal directly or they just have a comfort factor. One of the things that we were toying around with was who did John Travolta find in prison that he could use to help him do this thing? And, you know, we settled on a train um, conductor who had been in prison for driving drunk or driving under the influence and killed people and did stuff, you know, while he was there. And then he needed some muscle. And, um, and we looked through the usual suspects and they weren't, they were kind of, okay, we've seen this before and generally it's been overplayed. Don went out and researched, found these two guys called Victor and Robert, and um, they're real guys, real guys. One day, my father's calling me and telling me, you know, the lawyer is looking to talk to you, the lawyer is looking to talk to you for my lawyer. I'm thinking I caught a new case, something popped up from the past, I'm going back in jail. One day the lawyer leaves a message on the answer machine saying, Hollywood wants to meet with you. So I'm thinking I'm being set up I got a knock on my door one night at the hotel and three detectives were out in the hall with one guy, a big, tall guy with a beard who had that thousand mile stare and wouldn't smile. And they brought him in and sat him down and got me aside and said, this guy's the real deal. He's a Albanian uh, mixed up in some bad stuff and I uh, just got out of jail. They looked at my record and they said to me, this character got fucked over. And every time you've been arrested, you've got fucked over. You've been snitched on, you never snitched back. Could you consult? So I looked over at, at Victor and he was staring at me and he said, why, he said, why the fuck should I tell you anything? And, and by the way, what the hell am I even doing here? I was a little bit weary about this man, Don Ferrone. You know, I just met him. He worked with the state and the feds. So it's like, I'm against them and now he wants to talk to me and be friends. So I said, I got introduced him to Tony with the idea that we would just use them with the writer and use them uh, with the uh, actors, the train actors, and, and just be around to kind of help set people and costume people and all that kind of thing. So brought him over to Tony and Tony, after about an hour, looked at me and said, I'm gonna put these guys in the movie. And I said, well, don't say it in front of them. And, you know, he asked me why not and I said, because if for some reason there's a slip up here, this is Albanian, this is old, they have a code. The code is what they call the Code of Luca Gini. It's a, it's a code that predates the, the mafia in Sicily. These guys are a notch up from that. So you don't promise them anything. And of course, we turned around, they continued their conversations, and then Tony suddenly blurted out and said, I'm gonna put you in the movie. So as soon as he told me this, first thing I said to him was, I have a cousin. And my cousin, which is the character Emery, Robert Vitage, I'm like, you have to meet him. You know, he's been chasing this for eight, nine years, doing Broadway shows, extras, whatever the fuck you want to call it. He was doing it waiting on lines. So I wanted to do him a favor. So I told Tony, you got me, my cousin. He's like, oh, this, that. I'm like, the deal is you meet my cousin, anything you want. What do you say? Shoot your orders. Exactly. So finishes it. I'm going to be in the zone more, more scary. Yeah. No, but that, you, that was good, man. You were scary enough. Fuck. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm just going to play with the gun a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The first or second audition, you know, uh, we shook hands, you know, and when the person, you know, he goes to pull away from the handshake. And I didn't let him go. <laughs> you know, I held on to the handshake for like five or ten seconds. And I was like, Tony, I said, this is my contract. He's like, what do you mean? I said, this is my contract. I said, you know, I, I don't need the piece of paper. You tell me I got the role or, you know, you give me a word right now. I trust you. He's like, whether or not you have the role, I'm going to call you. And three months down the line, I get the phone call from Tony Scott. You know, the message over the phone, hey, it's Tony Scott. I said I was going to call you. I kept my word. You know, come down. Let's have another meeting. We had another meeting, and I got it. And action! Sit the fuck up! Who is your tail? Once you have your, your fiction, your, once you have your, your script, then you layer in reality onto the script, it, it becomes a whole different movie. I think my process is fairly unique. It's a lot of work, but in the end, it's much easier when you're actually shooting, you know, if you have real people to reference and a real world to reference. I'm always inspired by the real world, so I get to educate myself in terms of touching worlds that I would never touch myself as a movie director, and I get to entertain myself, which is what I want, like to do in my movies. Shooting in New York is a nightmare. <laughs> when I say it's a nightmare, I went in there because the first answer is no. You can't tell them no. You want to, you know, you tell them no, like, no, I can't do this. I really can't do this and they just, they find ways to make it work for him. We brought Janice Polly with us, who's a location scout, who's been with Tony for many, many years, and, and, and she's the terrier. So you just send her in, and uh, you get the, you're kidding, you're kidding, but she gets it. She gets it, gets it all, and it's, she's just amazing. And, she's, uh, and so we're right behind her, and she gets it, we're in there figuring it out. No is just another hurdle to get over until we get to yes. So with Tony, he's relentless. He will, he, he, he at times really knows what he wants, and at times he knows what he wants when he sees what he doesn't want. And then as time goes on and, and we got him on our side, then, it, and I, then I really enjoy it. But I didn't understand that that is just part of New York's personality to say no first. They basically give us a rough idea of what they're looking for and we let them know what we can accommodate them with. And we basically reach a compromise. You know, in some respects, uh, we're limited to what we can do and what we can't do, of course. You know, this is not a sound stage. This is a, it's a live uh, functioning system. So it's not like we can shut everything down just to accommodate the, uh, the production company. The easy way would have been to build a tunnel and a train in the, you know, in an armory or in a big sound stage, and then shot everything that way. But not so much whether it's the easy way or the hard way, realistically, there's something about being in the environment that the movie takes place that helps bring it to life. It's tough shooting that many, but it's great. This is the bowels of, of the city, you know, and, and uh, what people normally do is build sets and, and try and reconstruct it, you know, on a stage. But I think there's nothing like the real world, you know, capturing it. It's, it's hard shooting down here. It's difficult. It's dirty. It's, but it's exciting and it's dangerous. I'm using real trains running at 40, 50 miles an hour with Denzel jumping out of the way and, and John and these 12 Indian kids. And so it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. I always love a challenge because it sort of, you know, inspires me to reach for different things. It's dirty, it's dark, and it's a, it's a very close environment with all of us all on top of each other and shooting with four cameras all the time. It's tough. Everything has to go in without fixing to the fabric of the building. So everything has to be wedged in and then all our lights fixed to it. But it's like right into the corners and that's where all the dust is. So the guys get utterly black. You know, and it, and, it's, it, and it, this dust is so fine, it gets everywhere but it's well worth it because when you start intercutting all of the stage stuff with the, with the real stuff, it's, it's, it, it just looks great. We had half of our time was spent in actual subways in the tunnels and then half of the time was on a set created as, as such. And to be honest, once you're in that compartment and uh, once you're in that atmosphere, it doesn't feel that different. The main qualities are small, oppressive, and stuffy. Hey, get me Bastion! And find your fucking guts! You know, I can't say I wasn't glad that it, that it was over. I had enough. Three months of being in a dungeon-like atmosphere uh, was, was enough, but 
Did it help? Of course. It helped create an ambiance and atmosphere for the characters to thrive in. The biggest challenge in this movie, unlike some of the other movies, which were shot basically on the platforms and on a moving train where you can control the people and you can control the, the action, the biggest obstacle on this movie is actually shooting on the track, removing the power, restoring the power, integrating the train with the actor and the production company personnel that have to set up the lights and the cameras and also allowing the passenger trains to move on the adjacent tracks. Normally the MTA will tell you these are the places that you shoot, um, but we want something different. We want to bring something more to the, to the film. So we always take it to the next level. We want to go to places that are difficult to shoot but are visually interesting. Really having two trains two different tracks simultaneously. That really was a major challenge for us. It's like, how, where can we actually film this and not inconvenience our customers? Where can we do it and um, everyone is safe? I think the biggest challenge for us, uh, for my side of it, is the longevity of the shoot. Now, normally, uh, when we do a movie shoot, it maybe lasts one day, maybe two days. Very rarely do we have a movie shoot that, I, that I've been involved in that last six weeks. And since the bulk of this is all subways, whatever they couldn't shoot in the studio, the rest is down here. And to get everybody to be on the same page for six weeks, it takes a lot of resources. On the real train, we're doing everything where you would see the train moving. You'd be wide enough to see the wheels and wide enough to see the environment which the train is in. You ready? We're rolling the trains. Everything that took place inside the train, we felt it would make more sense to do on a soundstage. We shot on stage at Astoria, we built a set there, and we built the train car for most of the, the dialogue and the host in the interior train car we, we built on stage. It became evident that we were going to need um, a car that we could pull all the walls and all the ceilings and, and to a certain degree get a little bit of movement out of. Go heavier, Mark. Do the, the, the hard stop, and everybody loses loses their balance. Can, and he gives a hard stop now. Yeah, I think crank, crank it up yeah, one hard. Yeah. So we could move the car 30, 40 feet, and then where the um, the cop gets shot, and he says stop the car, and he hits the button. We do all that on on the set because in reality, to stop a 10 car subway train, you d it, d it doesn't stop on a dime, where we can make this one do that. Anytime we're on the set, we came up with a trans light and these very lights which simulate the movement of a train. So I think when you look out the windows, you see the trans light lit up and the sound, you'll believe it's a real train. As long as you don't hold on it and you keep moving and you've got passengers in the car and with the sound effect, it just feels like a moving train. Rolling cameras, rolling video, everything's rolling. Shooting the locations that we did were some of the most difficult in New York, whether it be the bridges, whether it be, you know, Fifth Avenue, whether it be Lexington, Madison, all these different areas that are, are so packed with so many people, so many vehicles, so many different parameters by the city themselves, not only because of filming, but since 9-11, there are so many restrictions put on us. The amount of stunts, the amount of action we wanted to do was very difficult. The money run was another device or vehicle, in a metaphoric sense, that I could use as a ticking clock. It was another way of cross-cutting energy, cross-cutting different worlds with these two guys talking to each other, you know. The money run was a huge organizational plan with the amount of traffic control and 100 PAs, and it took a lot of organization to get that put together. It became apparent that we might have to separate this stuff out in, and create an action unit, a second unit, to cover this, these sequences. This was the first film that Tony has ever done, either, either before I came along or after I've come along, that he's ever had a second unit. And I think begrudgingly he agreed to the second unit, you know, to kind of release the, the power of having that and the control of having his style and his stamp on it um, because of the parameters of shooting in the city, what they would give us, the locations they would give us, when they would give us those locations, and the time frame that he had to shoot everything and to get it done in an expeditious way. Basically our first day of shooting out of the box, Tony was on set. 
because he really wanted to be a part of it and put his stamp on the action. So he was with us for basically four, the first three or four weekends that we shot. He just couldn't stay away. He wanted to go out there and shoot it all himself. It's what he loves to do. So for about four weeks, he went, he shot for five days on stage and then went out and shot on the weekends with the second unit crew all of the action sequences for the money run. And I think the difference with the stunts that we're doing this time in this movie is that it's um, it's all about bone chilling hits. Everything's done at, at ultra high speed. There's, there's no cosmetics, it's just how hard and how fast they can drive and hit. Brian and I struggle, you know, with how the two characters are gonna finally resolve, yeah. And and in the end, everything comes to bear when, you, when, you, when you're with script and you're with locations and you say, well, the movie opens with the city of New York being the bad guy, and I want to see it close with the city of New York as the third character, the third character there on camera. So we try to find a location which gave us an overview of Wall Street, yeah? And obviously, the obvious place was then the bridges, yeah? We found on Manhattan Bridge, had a train running across it, so I had all my elements in one location at the end. I remember when we first mentioned it, they just said, It'll never be done. And, but lo and behold, you break it down, you sy systematically go through it with all the relevant people and the re relevant agencies. We had a weekend to do it, a Saturday and Sunday. And Saturday morning, we staged a huge traffic jam on the Manhattan Bridge. It's got two levels, the bridge, and we were able to keep the upper levels open to traffic and close the lower level, uh, which is where Tony wanted to shoot because Right alongside the, the traffic are trains running on either side across the bridge, subway trains. So we had hundreds of cars, we had three helicopters, we had trains going by, and it was just, it was a massive thing for us to coordinate. And being up on the bridge and walking across the tracks up there is just something that, uh, it can be very difficult to do if you're not used to it. You know, you're out over the water, there's gaps between the ties. Then on the Sunday, we uh, shot on the walkway itself, um, but what happened that day is we had rain coming in for the afternoon, and so we were, we were shooting away, and, uh, and we got delayed several hours by rain. We just had to wait it out. We got really lucky with the rain that it ended, and, and the sun came out right at the end of the day. We were able to shoot dialogue coverage and then everybody scrambled to get all the equipment off the bridge as Tony raced over to the helicopter landing pad down the road, came up in a helicopter and shot uh, helicopter shots of the two actors playing the sequence out at the end of the movie and coordinating the train going by at the same time. It was amazing. All the elements of the story there in one frame, Denzel, John, and the city of New York. I ain't going back to prison. He sees the movie in his head and he sees the individual scenes and he sees the way they're most interestingly shot and he sees the composition of them and he understands where to zero in and where to pull back and he just, he's a painter. The nice thing about working with Tony is he brings you in and makes you part of the process and we figure out the movie together. But ultimately, the goal is to make a good movie and that's what we fight for every single day. It's amazing what you get, not just in terms of the action side of it, but what you get in terms of performance when you put real actors in those situations with real trains blowing. Then I continued on, I put them in real traffic, I put them with real helicopters, and so John's fighting the performance and Denzel are fighting the helicopter. But it's good because it gives you a reality and a life that the actors find easier to embrace if they're inside the real world rather than having to manufacture it in their own minds. The real MTA, the real subways down below, real bad guys that Tony researched with John Travolta, real people that worked on Wall Street. As long as you have a base of realism, you can stretch from there, but everything has to be grounded up front. All the elements in the movie I could bring to the canvas. So the elements in terms of hostages in a subway, the money market shift, I've got the quietness of the MTA. These two characters are two total extremes. Everything is really about extremes in this movie. And it's a movie that never lets you off the hook. From the point your ass hits that seat, more than any other movie I've done, you're like, <gasps> you never let go.